team. Um, and I'm going to facilitate the session today. Um, welcome everyone. I'm going to start sharing my screen so we can dive right into the content for today. We have uh, like a lot of really cool people with us today. Um, oh. Okay, can you see my screen? If someone can just put a thumbs up or... Yes, yeah, it's visible. Perfect. Okay, so you're here because you're interested in the Youth Assembly. And this webinar is um, supposed to give you two tools and show you how you can uh, fundraise your way to this year's Youth Assembly. Um, in the next 60 minutes, we're going to have uh, like super experts who will help you with that. The first one is Daniela Kais. She's going to talk about the three principles of great fundraising. Then we have Milena Milarinovic, who will talk and share how to create your own narrative and how to present yourself um, publicly. And then we have our Youth Assembly ambassadors, Dana Anzi and Daniela Kolros, who will share their successful fundraising experiences because they have done this before. Um, and at the end, we have a Q&A. Um, so hold, just listen for the first part and then save your questions for the end. Um, we hope to have plenty of time um, for questions then. <clears throat> okay, um, I would like to introduce Daniela first. So she's a philanthropy advisor with 25 years of experiences uh, launching, managing, and scaling large programs. She has raised over 100 million in philanthropic funds. And she's the founder of Gracias Partners, a philanthropy advising firm that optimizes mm -hmm. philanthropic giving and um, impact to tackle urgent social challenges. So she's here to share her experiences and I'm really happy that she's here. Thank you for spending your time on a Saturday morning with us and I'll just um, give the floor to you. Thank you so much, Steffi. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good morning. It's so nice to see everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. So let's get started to talk about three principles of fundraising that I would like you to keep in your head as you think about starting this journey of fundraising for the Youth Assembly. I want you to, I'm gonna tell you three stories and I want you to keep three images in your head, okay? First, I want you to imagine an aspirin. Second, I want you to imagine a harpsichord. A harpsichord is an obscure musical instrument. And third, I want you to imagine a chocolate cake. Okay, those are the three images I want you to keep in your head. What the heck does that mean? Let me tell you what that means and how they illustrate three principles of great fundraising. The first principle, Okay, you've got the aspirin in your head now. So a lot of the work of AFS, the Youth Assembly, nonprofit organizations, wherever you live, is, is like a vitamin for the world. It's really super important that we keep the world healthy, we keep the world strong. You know, the things that we do in the nonprofit sector are like vitamins. They, you know, they, they really keep us strong and let us live good, healthy lives. That's the point. However, I don't know about you, but, but I, in the morning, I take out my vitamins next to my breakfast. I line them up and I eat my breakfast and I forget to take my vitamins. Sometimes I even put them in my pocket as I'm going to work because I know I have to take them later. And when I get home at the end of the day, you know what? They're still in my pocket. So my advice to you, my first piece of advice to you, the first great principle of fundraising that you should know is this. When I have a headache, I immediately go to my medicine cabinet and I grab my aspirin. Nothing can stop me, right? I forget my vitamin, but the aspirin, I have to go immediately to my cabinet and have it. And the lesson there is that you know, a lot of fundraising and a lot of philanthropy is actually alleviating the pain of the donor. What do I mean by that? I mean that, you know, in your country right now, there could be a foundation, there could be a civic group that is sitting around and saying, we really wish we could find some bright young people to support, to do something innovative, but we can't find them. Where are they? They have a pain point. They have something they want to do urgently and really effective 
fundraising addresses both that pain point of someone, it solves a problem. That's the lesson of the aspirin. The aspirin solves a problem, whereas the vitamin is sort of just good for us. And both of those elements are good principles of successful fundraising. Okay, so that's the first thing to remember. You've got the aspirin in your head. The second story I'm gonna tell you is about the harpsichord. And before I had this conversation with someone, I didn't even know what a harpsichord was, but it is a musical instrument. So, you know, what, what are you gonna tell people about raising money? Are you gonna tell them about your background and your grades, or are you going to show them a picture and tell them an inspirational story about yourself? Well, what I've learned over time is that both things are so important, both of them, appealing to the head and to the heart. And I'll tell you a story that I hope will, will um, illustrate this and make you remember this point. So a few years ago, uh, so in the nonprofit world, there's a big movement to measure impact. So if I have a program, the Youth Assembly, and it's being funded, the funders will want to know, well, what impact did it have? How many people came? How many participants um, did innovative projects? What was the result? Give us data, data, data. So I had a lunch a few years ago with one of the foremost um, scholars in impact data. He's a man named Michael Weinstein who worked for the Robin Hood Foundation and then started a program called Impact Matters. And he developed with Yale economists a proprietary system for measuring whether, for example, one food bank in New York could give out more meals per dollar versus another. Everything was very precisely measured. So we had lunch together. He was telling me about his methodology. It has since been taken over by Charity Navigator, which is a big um, assessment tool in the United States. And I, and, and he had just told me that, oh, good news, I have a new grandchild, a new granddaughter. And I said, Michael, that's so wonderful. In honor of your grandchild, I would like to give a gift of $1,000 to a nonprofit of your choice. Because I wanted to give him a gift and I thought he would appreciate this in his granddaughter's name. So tell me, who should I give it to? And I thought he was going to tell me, this food bank, that food bank, one of the many nonprofits he measures impact. And he said to me, I want you to give it to the New York Harpsichord Society. And I said, what? What is that? That's crazy. He said, a harpsichord is a very old instrument that I love and I play the instrument and I get together every Sunday and we play it. And it's so meaningful to me. So this taught me such an important lesson. If the foremost expert in the world, in the, in the United States on impact measurement, asked me to give to the Harp Support Society, why? Because there was a human connection there. Fundraising is somewhat of a science, but it's a human science. So I'm telling you this story to, to tell you that it's not only about um, giving people data about yourself and what you want to do, but inspiring them and speaking to their heart. And very often people will give funds to young people who remind them of themselves when they were young and just starting out. So that's my second story. So you've got an aspirin, you've got a harpsichord. And now I'm gonna tell you about my last principle of great fundraising. And to illustrate it, I use the chocolate cake. Okay, we all love chocolate cake. And sometimes we feel like having a chocolate cake, a homemade chocolate cake. Okay, so I'm sitting at my kitchen table. I feel like a chocolate cake, a homemade chocolate cake. Um, is it possible that my doorbell is going to ring and my neighbor is there and says, Daniela, I miss you. I've been thinking about you and I just baked a chocolate cake for you. It is absolutely possible that that would happen. Is it likely? It's really not likely. Many people think about fundraising as sitting at the table waiting for the chocolate cake, okay? I have had 
presidents of universities abroad in, in all sorts of, in the US and Germany and Japan, just off the top of my head, say to me, oh, fundraising is like winning the lottery. I'm just going to buy a ticket and wait for it to happen. And I say to you, let's think about this, okay? If you want a chocolate cake, what do you have to do? You actually have to think, well, let me get the recipe. Let me buy, go to, I have to go to the store. I have to buy the ingredients. I have to go back to my kitchen. I have to mix them all up, bake them in the oven, and then I can have my chocolate cake. Fundraising is, is like the chocolate cake. It requires effort, work, maybe looking up a recipe, strategizing, you know, what cake am I going to bake? And also, you know, as my third principle says, diversifying, iterating, asking. You have to ask, you have to put the cake in the oven or it's never going to get baked. So I want you to think about that chocolate cake because the chocolate cake is something you want and it's good and you want to go to the youth assembly. But, but many people think of fundraising as more of a magical thing that just appears. You know, you say you want it and somehow or the other, the money comes. Does that happen? Yes. Very rarely. As, as rare as winning the lottery, does that happen? M most fundraising, 99.999% is that someone has made tremendous effort to think about strategically what should the message be, to approach many different sources, um, to ask, you can ask in a nice way. Um, this is a very uh, common problem. People are, are afraid to ask, but, but here I'm gonna give you a phrase that you can use. Would you consider supporting me to attend the Youth Assembly? That's very soft and very nice. And the person might say, well, and the person may want to say no, but they'll say, well, let me think about it. So you don't put them on the spot. You don't feel bad about it. But my point is that you have to ask if you don't heat up the oven and put the cake in there, you'll have very, very little chance of, of having it. So I'll stop there. Those are my three principles. And I told you those stories because hopefully you'll remember the aspirin, the harpsichord, and the chocolate cake, and what they mean for great fundraising. So thank you very much, uh, Steffi, and happy to have the next um, the next part of the program. Thank you so much, Daniela. Um, I'm hungry now, so thank you for that. <laughs> um, I love that image of the, the chocolate cake, um, and I think we can continue from there because our next presenter um, is Milena Miladinovic, and she's going to share a bit how we can bake that chocolate cake. Um, Milena is an external affairs expert. She works at AFS International. Um, she's a proven communications expert with 12 years of experience in project management, strategic content development, in external communications across various platforms and in charge of fundraising management from individual donors, donor cultivation, solicitation planning, and delivery at AFS. Um, so Milena, I'm handing over to you. And uh, just a reminder, because I see some one participant has their hand up, um, we are going to have a Q&A round at the end of all the presentations. Um, and I will put your name down for the first question. Um, thank you, Steffi, so much. And thank you, Daniela, for these images. I have to say I'm up for a chocolate cake right now. <laughs> um, but before that, let me just quickly ask everyone if you can find the reactions button or just in the chat, put up the emoji that summarizes how you feel after you heard this first part. Um, it can be a chocolate cake emoji, but it can also be um, maybe for somebody it was the aspirin that stuck the most or people are just happy. Okay, I can see that. That's that's very good to know. Um, so yes, Daniela, this was a perfect uh, setting for, for what I was planning to, to share. And really, as you can see in the title, I want to talk about your digital presence. And this is a little bit of the 
of a combination of your vitamin and your um, chocolate cake recipe, right? So your digital presence really matters and uh, when, when you're doing anything and especially in fundraising for one simple reason. The first time you reach out to somebody, uh, if they don't know about you or they're not sure who you are or what you're talking about, the first thing they're gonna do is they're going to Google it. They're going to search your name. They're going to search for the youth assembly to see what this event is all about. And you want to make sure that what comes up in their search is something that tells a good story, something that motivates them to support you and to support your cause. And so really first, the first thing you can do is to just um, think about what uh, serves you best, what serves your purpose best. What channel is it? Of course, you may have the time and the resources to be on all the channels and to maintain five different social media profiles for you personally or for the organization that you represent or for your university. But if you don't, and if you really need to focus and just select a few, think carefully what it is. Where is your audience? Where are the people that you are trying to talk to? Where are um, your allies? Where are other people who are similar to you, who care about the similar cause? Um, and make sure that you are there, make sure that you are getting noticed there. And then my, my second point would be that, so once you're already there, once you know what matters and how to present yourself well, then it's really about making sure you emphasize what matters the most. So you all are probably amazing, not probably, I'm sure you are all amazing young people with a lot of achievements, but people only spend such a short time on getting to know others and on looking things up. And so you want to make sure that in this short time that they dedicate to you, your most important achievements stand out so that if you published a paper, if you led a campaign, if you got an award for something, if you have a certificate that speaks about why you're an expert on a topic, you want to make sure that that is one of the first things they can find about you. And then another thing is um, we all kind of, you know, if choosing between two chocolate cakes, we will go for the one that our friends tell us is the better chocolate cake. Um, so what other people say about you really matters, especially if those people are, you know, trustworthy and well known for something really good. So think about who are those people that can recommend you, that can speak about you favorably, that can speak about you with knowledge of what you do and what your expertise is and make sure that they are doing that. So that can be a recommendation on your LinkedIn profile. That can be the fact that they tweeted about you and, and so you can share that. That can be that they invite you to their events, but just make sure that you know who your allies are and keep engaging with them. And so I come to my third point now, which is the engagement, which means that once you are on your chosen platform, you're presenting yourself right, you have your allies there, then it's all about consistency. You have to keep that engagement going because if somebody looks up your profile and they see you haven't posted anything since 2018, they will know something's not right here. They will be suspicious. So it's not about posting 10 times a day on 20 different platforms, but it's about making sure there's some regularity there and that what you post is really insightful or somehow adding something to the conversation that you're not, not just making noise, but that you have some experience or some insight to share. And then, uh, the good thing here is to remember that, you know, you're not just kind of shouting into the void, but that you are interacting with other people who are out there. Um, so somebody may have posted something you really like. Make sure you comment on that and tell them how much you appreciate it. Or, I, I don't know, you find this organization that is really relevant for your cause. Make sure you're following and engaging with them. Just make sure that you are 
interacting and in these interactions is where you build the relationships and where you kind of lay the groundwork for then being able to make the ask at some point. And so whatever you do, just keep following up. Make sure they're not offs, but that once you've made a connection, that you keep following up with these people. And so that's a little bit about you and this um, emotional part, what Daniela was talking about, that once people find you, that they can see themselves in you. Uh, but the other piece of the puzzle is that you are talking about the Youth Assembly and AFS Intercultural Programs, the organization that runs the event. And so in your outreach, you should be prepared to talk about these things uh, using beta, using vetted information that is already out there. And that's where the Youth Assembly website really um, can be of great help. Um, first of all, you don't have to keep this information all in your head. You don't have to know it in the middle of the night. But what you should know in the middle of the night is where to look for it. And the Youth Assembly website is the first place to start because you have all the basic information there. You have you know, the year that the event was founded, how many events have happened so far, how many people have participated so far, who are some of the notable alumni or the other organizations who partnered uh, with the Youth Assembly. So all the great things that will help you describe what this event is about, but with facts, not just with feelings. And then you also have the concept note of the 2023 Youth Assembly. So you can talk about, look, this is the theme of the event. These are the content tracks that we're going to do there. These are the kinds of awards I can win if I participate. So this is all in one place and, and you can speak with confidence about it. And then if you need anything more, you can also show, well, here's how the previous 27 youth assemblies worked and what the content was and who attended. And kind of in that same vein, you can talk about the AFS intercultural programs, again, going to the organizational website. And just, you know, if you don't know anything else about it, the annual report is the first place to start that will give you a great overview of what this organization does, what it achieved in the last year, who are its partnerships, um, what are the latest news, and just if people ask you then, so why should I support you? Why should I support this youth assembly? Well, here it is. Here's um, the credibility that the organizers and the event itself bring. So that was a little bit from me. I'm sure you have some questions, but I think I'll turn it back over to, to Steffi and then we can come back again. Thank you so much, Milena. And um, I feel like there are so many resources that you can use. So first of all, yes, we are going to share the recording of this meeting. We're going to share the slides. So you have access to all the links in, um, on the Youth Assembly, on AFS programs. Um, and we have more resources that I'm quickly going to share. Um, they are on the Youth Assembly website. So you can also look at them um, before you receive the slides. If you click on the little hamburger menu on the top right, there, then um, on the left, there should be the guide to grassroots fundraising, and it will go in depth again. Um, you will learn more about how to set goals, what tactics and resources you can use. And there's also a sample letter and some extra details that can help you fundraise for this specific um, reason. Um, so just check it out on the website. And then we've added a couple of links from external resources that we thought were helpful. Um, there is a beginner's guide to fundraising. Um, it's super detailed. There's, it's like a really rich website. Just click yourself through. It's on the fundraisingexpert.com site. There is uh, another fundraising guide. Um, it's, there are so many more free resources that you can find there. There is a, um, another recommendation we have about identifying an ideal partner for your, um, for your venture. So you have like support um, and another guide on business partnerships and how to, how to find the right partner, how to build and manage them. And those are all resources that you can find on the website. So 
just moving forward, be resourceful in your fundraising. And now I'm going to um, introduce our first ambassador because this was a lot of like theory and like things that you can do. And for me personally, it's always super helpful to learn how did someone actually implement that and how, what did they do to be successful? Um, so, oh, sorry, there is a typo in the headline. This is Dana. She is our ambassador. She's a very experienced Youth Assembly ambassador. She has worked with numerous UN agencies and foundations on sustainability projects related to education, refugee empowerment, and youth advocacy. She has graduated with a bachelor's degree in foreign service from Georgetown University in 2017, and is currently pursuing her master's in social and public communication at the London School of Economics and Political Science. So I'm really excited to hear uh, from you, Dana. So I'll give the floor and please share what has worked for you. Hello, everyone. I'm just uh, wondering if you can see me. Yes. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Steffi. Uh, it's great to meet you virtually. Thank you for having me. And big hello to everyone, um, including the AFS family who are with us um, online. Firstly, I think one thing that's very important for us to point out is this is not easy, right? I, I know how difficult it can be uh, to fundraise, uh, to kind of get support, to kind of get, um, get people to, to be on board with your mission and to really understand where it is that you're coming from. So uh, the way we have done it is uh, we started as a group, a small group. I personally always believe in working in a team. So um, we started as a small group and then we chose a strategy. You have two different ways you can go about this. The first one is you can either get a corporate organizational. So in, in the corporate sense, uh, is tracking down a company that works on sustainability locally or an organization uh, that uh, works on sustainability locally or has a CSR component uh, that supports uh, the mission of the Youth Assembly. Or you can just go public and start a GoFundMe account and uh, resource uh, people pitching in very small amounts, which eventually really do add up uh, to support your mission. So once you've chosen a strategy, it can be a mix of both, but you need to know what path you think is the best within your community. Uh, the second one is I like to say, know your basics. We always get carried away with the bigger picture of things, but sometimes it's this being prepared with the little things that really gets you ahead with whatever you're trying to pull off. So the first thing that I usually do is I sit down and I'm like, okay, this year, allegation and they're going to New York. Who can I speak to? I sit down and I literally start Googling different companies in the Middle East, uh, different entities in the Middle East or within Qatar that have had uh, a, a sponsorships or have had any form of activity uh, with regards to sustainability. And that's when I say to myself, okay, that's great. These are my people whether it's universities, which we've had before, whether it's corporate, whether it's governmental, these are the entities I'm targeting. Once I've done that, I start Googling people that work within these organizations, whether it's through LinkedIn, whether it's through social media, and I target those people. And then I move forward to reaching out to them via email, via letter, uh, via, via anything that you um, feel is important that they should know about in order to support you financially. Most importantly though, create a budget. I know this sounds very um, very old school, but then you, so we, we, we had this once where we got the approval, we were very excited, and then they, they asked us, you know, how much do you need? And it, it was a moment of, oh, well, we thought you were just gonna provide us with sponsorship. We're not sure how much we need. So we had to go back and say, okay, let's put up a budget. And the budget is very simple. Googling what the cost of a hotel would be, something that would be suitable for you. Googling what the flight would be, something that is suitable from wherever your country of origin is, going to New York, and a stipend. Something that can keep you going, um, something that can you know, get you snacks for the day, lunch, dinner, cover that kind of support. And that's your budget. Beyond that, um, share your story, but also sell it. So who are you? Why are you doing this? and make sure that this is well tailored to the organization. I never send 
uh, one thing to everyone. It does not work that way. Each organization has a different mission. Sometimes they have a different, sometimes they have a different focus. So make sure that you give them the time the way they're giving you their time to tailor what they're interested in and align your goals with theirs. And that's fine. That's how it is it done basically day to day uh, business. Um, but beyond that, again, I try to encourage you to work within um, uh, with, with ambassadors or uh, within groups. It's very, very difficult to work alone. And if you are working alone, honestly, I really do feel for you. Uh, so reach out to ambassadors, even if it's just to say, hey, look, I've made this much progress. It's going great. I've had a few setbacks, um, but here's where we made progress. And this is what I'm trying to do. It's not going to be easy, but having a support system uh, makes it easier. And before I, I jump to my last point, um, offer, offer them something in return. Offer them that, for example, uh, you will do an interview discussing how uh, they have supported you, or you will uh, co-author uh, with another youth delegate uh, a press release or anything of that sort, because that's what they look for when they're supporting youth. They want to um, feel like they were involved and that it is made public for their targets, for their KPIs, whatever the case may be. So let them know what it is you're willing to offer, whatever you're comfortable with and how you're comfortable doing. That's always um, an exchange for the ask, usually with corporate uh, or governmental um, entities. And lastly, um, failure is part of the journey. I have failed many, many, many times, but uh, I've also succeeded many, many times. There was a time where I've had an entire delegation not go last minute because a sponsor pulled out and that was 25 people staring at me saying so we're not going are we going and it, you know it was like the rug was pulled from underneath our feet but at the end of the day we put in the effort we came back stronger and uh, to date we have had over 70 young Qatari delegates uh, go to the so it's a lot of hard work um, but believe in yourself and every rejection is a redirection and uh, I wish you the best of luck everyone thank you guys Mm, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and I love how you started and said, it's not easy, but believe it can be done. And for all the steps in between that you've shared, um, that was like really helpful. And thank you for also um, sharing your like failing. I feel like that's such a big part. And um, yeah, that was very powerful to hear. Um, thank you for that. Um, and I'm going to move to the next, Ambassador, this was really amazing, Dana, thank you. Um, now we're also going to hear from Daniela Colross, who's also an experienced Youth Assembly Ambassador. Um, she's a law and international trade student at the Universidad, uh, Universidad La Salle in Costa Rica. And she currently works in an international law firm as well as the Costa Rican um, Congress. And she's the founder and executive manager of an NGO called Young Leaders Costa Rica, working to promote the SDGs and positive leadership in Costa Rica. Um, so Daniela, the floor is yours and I'm very excited to hear another experience um, of fundraising for the Youth Assembly. Is Daniela on the call? I don't see her. Mm. Okay, then we're going to improvise and maybe uh, I saw her in the beginning, maybe she had a bad connection. If she comes back, um, we're going to move back to this, but um, if not, then I would say we, uh, we move to the Q&A, and if Daniela comes back, we can, um, she can share her slides. Um, so what questions do you have about fundraising? Um, to have, keep this a bit organized, please raise your Zoom hand or use the chat. I see that the chat is very, very lively. Um, I would encourage you to keep your questions or your introduction rather short and focus on the question. If you want to address a certain um, expert we had on the call, then please um, name that. And if we don't have time to answer all questions, then please check the fundraising page, join the LinkedIn group Youth Assembly Delegates. Um, if you have more questions to the ambassadors, there's also more events coming up. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen and just encourage you to share the questions you have 
um, for our speakers um, in terms of fundraising. And you can also post them in the chat if you feel more comfortable than um, speaking in front of the entire group. Um, and if you don't have any questions, then I just assume that the content was just so amazing and rich that a lot of your questions have already been answered. Okay, thank you, Melina, for sharing the link. This is the group for Youth Assembly Delegates. And we encourage you to, to just join the group and um, you can share a lot with other delegates that are there. Um, I, I have a question I could, I could ask. Um, I wanted to ask Dana a question about how did she get started? So when I you know, do a fundraising project, sometimes I feel very overwhelmed, like by the beginning of it, and I'm not sure where to start. And it just feels overwhelming. And I wonder if she has any advice or tips for the group, you know, about her very first project. How did she, how did she approach it? And how did she get started? Hi, Daniela. Uh, first of all, you have us all craving uh, chocolate cake, and that's going to be my next <laughs> <Sorry>. task. <laughs> um, but uh, beyond that, I think um, being overwhelmed never, never kind of goes away, if I'm being honest. It's something that stays with me, even as an ambassador who takes an entire delegation uh, all the way from, from Qatar to New York, which is like a 14-hour flight. Um, but the way I like to organize it is really think about baby steps um, and work my way through. I just list everything I think I need to do. And then once I'm done with, I'm give myself a tick, a nice note, keep going, that went great. Uh, just kind of support myself and encourage myself through it. If I get a no, uh, I just say, you know, that that was okay. Here's, here's my backup plan and I move on to that. And that's why I believe in the process of mapping, of having things on paper because when it's in your head or in your heart, it's very overwhelming emotionally and, and mentally on you. But the minute you start writing it out on paper, it becomes really simpler and it just becomes regular tasks that you just gotta power through in a sense until it's done. And, and trust me, it's possible. I've seen, I've seen refugees at the youth assembly. I've seen people from all walks of life uh, who have managed to, to, to get themselves there uh, despite the odds. So, the way it is possible for me, it's possible for everyone. It's just baby steps, uh, Daniela, I guess. And you are the expert at the end of the day, but it really is baby steps. Well, you, you've you done it. And how do you, one follow-up question I have is, how do you find people to do it with? I, I, I was very taken by your, you know, don't do it alone. But yeah. how do you, I, I was assuming everyone was kind of fundraising for themselves. But yeah. tell, tell us about how you do it, how you gather a group. Well, personally, I think, so there, there is a, I have a bias in the sense where I do have a social media presence and there's a lot of people who are, who share my interests that follow me. Uh, and all I have to do is say, hey guys, this is our next mm. mission. And it. believe it or not, some we, the world can feel like such a big daunting place where we're so alone, but there's a lot of people, even on this very call, you can pair up with people on this call uh, that, that you can work with and say, look, let's, let's just put our heads together. How have you been? And just through friendship, uh, holding each other's hand and working through it step by step, it gets there. And you'll be surprised how many people are on the same path. All you have to do is reach out and ask. That's great. Thank you. Um, and we have two more questions, three. Um, I am going to give it first to uh, Kajal. I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Um, just unmute yourself. Uh, my name and... is Kajal. 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 Okay. I'm from Thank India. You. Uh, I want to ask a question to Dana. 
that you said that you failed so many times and you 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 also won so many times but when you fail so many times how you, do you pick yourself up i mean when i fail once i i feel so much demotivated now it, it it becomes very difficult to participate again and to try one more time how you pick yourself up and how you keep yourself motivated to participate again Um, Kajan, I, I know exactly what you mean. Um, failure is difficult, huh? And uh, it's okay sometimes to cry. It's okay sometimes to take a break and say, you know, today is my day off. I'm just gonna sit and cry and let it out. But I think about it this way, Kajal. Once you fail, you're at rock bottom, right? This is the worst you can do ever. You're right there. I take some time there and I say, okay, you know what? I failed today. That's fine. Today is, today is the day of failure. I'm not going to do anything else other than fail. But tomorrow is a new day. I allow myself to sit in the failure. Next day, I say, okay, there's only one way from the bottom, which is up. You can't go any lower than the bottom. You can't go any lower than failure. So there's only one way left for you to go, which is up. And then I pick myself up and I say, okay, you know what? Thank God, every rejection is a direction. I say this to myself, even with, with personal matters, you know, every rejection is a real direction. If this is not for me, this is for me. Let me try this path. I work over it again. I try to lift myself up and I work through that because there's only one way when you fail, it's up. So head up, work through it, power through, and then you look back and you'll be shocked. You say, wow. I did all of that, you know, I failed so many times. It was insane, but I did all of it, you know? So have faith. Mm, thank you. And I really, this, this so thought much. is so powerful. Uh, rejection is a redirection. I feel like we should really frame that as such a beautiful um, expression. Um, okay, then I have Delson with his hand up. Uh, Delson's also our Youth Assembly Ambassador. So um, please unmute yourself and yeah, let's hear from you. Uh, thank you so much. And I uh, thank you to Diana for the wonderful presentation. It's amazing seeing her again. And thank you, Steffi, for moderating this session. Um, I just have a question for would be delegates and delegates that are attending this session today. And I want to ask on their behalf probably to Diana. So in your presentation, you talked about, you know, a delegate sharing a proposal to a sponsor sharing how the goals of the Youth Assembly are going to align with the goal of that institution or that individual in order to be able to convince that person to sponsor their dedication or to, to sponsor that delegate. And a lot of times, especially like for me, I'm from Liberia. Um, one of the few challenges I've had over the years is that not too many people are interested from my end in youth development initiatives. Um, a lot of times they want you to either be politically involved with their political institutions or support their political ambition before you can get a level of support. And for me, I feel that um, it's something personally for me, I don't have interest in. I have interest in leadership, but I also want to see a more, I want to see more when it comes to youth development and youth empowerment without attaching them to politics. If they want to go into politics, it should be their ambition. But I feel that there are so many other areas. Like for me, I'm somebody that is passionate about technology. So I wouldn't want to like, okay, since I'm into technology, I can divert my path or my career interest and go into politics. So now, if you're from a region or a community that people, a lot of people don't believe in the SDGs or probably, Thing that you coming to the youth assembly is not going to benefit that community. What other actions can you take to be able to convince those corporate institutions, government agencies, and government officials that reside in this area 
to be able to believe in your dream and support you as young people. Dalton, uh, you're a good friend. You know that. Uh, if you ever need that kind of support, just message me, man. I'm happy to help you out personally. Um, but I, I understand where you're coming from with the question, and I'll start by sharing a story. So you guys remember the failure that I told you about, about those delegates that I, I couldn't take? Uh, it was precisely because of this, Dalton. I felt like ambassador, I had a choice. I was either going to um, force my delegation to support an agenda for an entity uh, because that was their rule. They said, you either do this or we don't send you. And I, I was faced with a very tough decision. I knew my decision was a no. I knew this was not gonna force my delegates to support uh, an agenda uh, for, for an entity so that they can go to the youth assembly. As a leader, what I did was I sat down with, with all my delegates and I said, uh, look guys, this is the situation. And the choice is yours. If you would like to go to the Youth Assembly with, uh, with this condition, um, this is what we have to deal with. And it, everyone supported the decision and everyone said, you know, we understand where we're at at the end of the day and we understand that this is a no. Uh, as an ambassador, my, my role is to facilitate uh, the fundraising activities or the sponsorship activities for my delegates and ensure that their best, their best interest as youth is always kept in mind first, uh, despite it being a big failure at the end of the day if they don't go. Um, what I would encourage you to do, uh, Dalton, is like, like Daniela said, uh, uh, focus on the concept of aspirin, give them a painkiller. If you see an organization that's working on green skills or green technology that's working on or has been under fire, for example, for a lack of CSR in the region in general, it doesn't just have to be where you're from. Or you're looking from, let's say, New York, and you have a huge community in New York from, from Liberians or Liberian uh, organizations. Talk to them, reach out to them and say, I think this is a great idea. I think this would add a great component if you were to support youth activities uh, under the umbrella. A lot of the time, companies don't know they need CSR or they need to support youth as part of their overall structure because they're so busy just focused on the business. The way we are so busy focusing on fundraising or SDGs in general. But when you introduce the concept of SDGs, when you introduce the concept of youth empowerment, supporting the youth, when you show them what it looks like in the newspapers or what it looks like when they announce that they have supported youth and how it's well received, a lot of times they'll be willing to support. And something great that the Youth Assembly does is they're willing to, for, to, to feature certain uh, sponsors uh, if they were to support the sponsorship of the Youth Assembly directly. So depending, of course, on, um, on, uh, on how it looks like or, or who they are, what their backgrounds are, sometimes it's good to just say, look, we can even have you featured. We can wear some, uh, something that indicates like a pin that indicates we are coming from your side and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of ways that you can market, uh, but not necessarily sell your soul to the devil per se, like you're saying, Dalton. Oh, thank you so much, and uh, I of appreciate that. Of course, and uh, to the question and the comment where it was CSR, it's corporate and social responsibility. A lot of organizations uh, have that component, um, corporate uh, social responsibility towards giving back to the society, and they have huge budgets usually that they just don't know what to do with. And you have to give them that as their aspirin. Say, hey, we know you're active in CSR, we have Googled your company and we would like to offer you to sponsor us. Yeah, because guys, you're not asking, never feel disempowered when you make that ask. Huh? Never feel like you are asking for something that's not because it's their job to do, uh, to support the community and give back. Yeah, um, thank you, Dinah. And we had a question in the chat uh, from Ben from Benin. Um, and he would like to know what can be done to better identify potential donors. So it's about like the search process. How can that be um, be better? And then how do you approach someone you've never had an exchange before? And what do you do if you don't get a response to your request? Um, and I would like to start with Daniela because I see you're, you're nodding. So it's, it's like a familiar problem. So Daniela, maybe you can um, take a shot at this. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to do that. And then 
uh, Malena, Dana, please, please uh, chime in also. Dana, I think you've had the most current, probably the most current experience in this of all of us. So that's a those are all really good practical questions. Um, Googling research is really good, as Dana was saying, and there's so much publicly available about different um, entities in Benin that might support you, foundations, corporations, maybe government agencies, um, or there might be international organizations that could provide some support. Um, and, uh, and, and the question was also, um, what do you do if you don't get a response? Is that correct? I'm looking at the chat. Or was there another part of the question? Yes, it's correct. What do you do if you don't get res a, a response? So that's actually a really excellent question for this group and something to highlight um, uh, because it's a very common problem. Very often you don't get a response when you send something. And from, you know, from our side, if, if we think of it from us, we've spent so much time researching and very carefully putting our data together, like Melena said, and like Dana said, um, you know, pitching it the right way, and then nothing. It's very disheartening. But the fact is that on the other side, you have to always think like the recipient. The donor maybe has received 100 requests that day. So I, in addition to doing fundraising, I work for a foundation, and boy, we get so many requests, maybe you know, a thousand more every year than we can possibly um, handle. And sometimes I don't even have time to write back and say, thank you, but we can't support you. So um, you have to distinguish yourself by being persistent. That is my, that is my um, short advice, that if you don't hear back, you need to follow up. Um, you need to try to call the person, try to reach out. Um, and, and I would say to you, sometimes it takes two or three outreaches before you get a response from someone. So I think you do have to be persistent. That that's my advice. But Dana and Melaine, I welcome you to answer as well. Uh, thank you, Daniela. That's that's perfect. I think the only thing I would add is um, when you're doing your research about who to contact, uh, which organizations, make sure to also look up really who the right person to contact is. Um, I know I've done this myself, that if I want to get in touch with somebody, I find an info at that their organization, whatever email is, I write to that, I write to their Instagram profile, I write to whatever address I can find, um, but some of those might not be the right place. So some of those um, contacts simply maybe don't know about opportunities, are not in charge of answering to you. Uh, it's a general email that nobody's really regularly checking. So that's why it's taking time for them to, to write back. So just make sure in this research to really figure out um, who is the point of contact, who has the information and the power to, to deal with you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. And um, I see there are two more questions. We're coming to the end. So please be precise. I'm going to um, ask Leroy to unmute himself and ask his question. And then hopefully we get also to Michael um, quickly before the end. Uh, basically, it's not a question, it's just a comment. Uh, just what my brother Jeton was saying, we we from a country where people see that you should be obligated to them politically to be supported. And one recommendation I would love the AFS to do is to establish a, 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 a station in Liberia, because I checked among the African country that AFS has their station. Liberia is isn't among it, and I don't know. So Steffi, can you please take note? Yes, it's not for me to decide where we have a presence, but um, you're absolutely right. We currently have a presence in Ghana, Kenya, South Africa, um, in Sub-Saharan Africa. So yes, that is a great idea. Um, and I, I did take notes. <laughs> I don't know how fast this could be done, um, but of course we would love to expand our presence. 
So we have two more minutes. So I'm going to give the last, thank you Leroy for that um, comment. And I'm going to give the last question to Michael before we close this call. Hello everyone. Um, good day to you all. Uh, my name is Michael. Yeah, I'm originally from Ghana, but I reside in the UK. Um, I, it's more of um, an addition to what everybody has said um, regarding raising funds, especially in Africa. I happen to also be a member of the Road Tracks Club and Rotary Club in Ghana. So I have quite an extensive idea of how fundraising goes about, especially when you want to raise it in sub-Saharan Africa. You know, usually um, there are a lot of organizations that would like to support such projects. And, and however, um, like you said, um, going through their email, it's sometimes they barely respond to you. So I would say that um, I would advise my brothers and sisters in sub-Saharan Africa, um, there's a very strong network of Rotary and Rotaract people. They're very strong. So if you want to check about Rotary, you can check Rotary District 9102. That's for West Africa. There are a lot of professionals within Rotary who are willing to support such projects. And so if you can get hold of a Rotary club close by you or a Rotary club, um, once they get to know what you're trying to do and what you're trying to achieve, um, I'm 120% sure they're going to support um, your project or whatever you intend to do. Um, so I think uh, my brothers and sisters in West Africa, I've been a member of the Rotary club for a while now and I know how impactful our projects have been and how they support young people to, uh, to uh, embark on such um, projects. So um, I just advise my brother here, I think there are a lot of road track clubs and road clubs in Liberia as well, and other parts of Africa, just get in touch, find a Rotary club, get in touch. We are all doing the same thing for humanity. We're just trying to do the same thing. So just get in touch. If it's about fundraising, you can get professionals who are within the Rotary club who represents companies. And for all you know, through the Rotary or Rotary Club, you can get to get some funding from such individuals' companies. So you can look through that angle as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Michael, for, for sharing that. Um, that like, I didn't know that, but I feel like this is very helpful or can be helpful for a lot of people. Um, and I would really encourage you to, to join this delegates group on LinkedIn to exactly share that kind of information because I didn't know that. So maybe others can benefit from that too. Um, and you can just um, request access and then um, post. So um, I see there was another person having a question. Unfortunately, we at, we're at the end. I just want to give us all our Saturday and um, enjoy our weekend. So join the group, check out the resources. We are going to share the recording and the um, presentation so you have access to everything. And um, I just want to highlight again, Dana said, don't do it alone, find, um, find support. And you can do that in the LinkedIn group. You can see on the website who our ambassadors are. Um, the Youth Assembly is meant to create a community of young active global citizens. So um, it's up to you how you take advantage of that, but we are like open and we want to create that space. So please do, you're all welcome. And I hope I get to see you um, after successful fundraising in August here in New York City. So have a great rest of the morning, afternoon, evening. And thank you to our speakers, Daniela, Milena, and Dinah. Thank you all. Very inspiring. Good Thank luck. you for having me. Thank you, Steph. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>